The spirits are the okay. spirits are talking through it. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I actually know, we hear that. <laughs> I, I actually know paranormal podcasters where that happens every time they try a podcast. <laughs> So, uh, we're going live on Facebook. I'm going to be copying everybody's links and putting it into the description. So, Deborah, you are taking control. <laughs> so, welcome everybody to our. Are we good to go? Good to go. Good to go. Okay, welcome everybody. It's you know Sunday night. It's that time. We are um, here, Global Strangeness, three strangers uh, brought together with a love of everything spooky, paranormal, and unexplainable. So that's myself, Jeremy, and Scott. And tonight, I am so, so excited for tonight's uh, show because we have guests here, and they're part of uh, paranormal um, teams that do investigations, which I'm, I'm psyched. I'm going to make Scott and Jeremy do this with me someday, even though I know they're chicken. I will be brave and I will protect you guys. <laughs> um, hey, but yeah, who I'm are you calling psyched. a chicken? Who are you calling a chicken? You I try, know, right? You, you, you I'll be the one hiding in the back, but honestly, I would love to do a, an actual investigation. And I'm really excited to uh, um, chat with these guys and hear about their experiences and everything and maybe learn a trick or two I don't know <laughs> to keep the cool so um I'm going to just let everyone in introduce yourselves and your teams and uh, a little bit of you know shout out about what you do and where you're from so uh take it away I guess we'll go around the room I see Jimmy you're the first one up for me so how will we start with you yeah you bet so uh Jimmy Sickles I am with the American Paranormal Investigative Team um I'll just kind of do a short introduction to myself we're all based out of Minnesota uh, we've been doing this uh, for a couple of years together as a team, and uh, I'll let uh, Jeremy go next. Uh, I'm Jeremy with uh, APIT. Um, we've been, I've been doing it for four years, but been around the paranormal my whole life. Zach and Josh, you'd be next. I'm Josh. I live in Park Rapids, Minnesota. And Jeremy pretty much pulled everybody into talking about the interest and we all had interest in paranormal and had different experiences. So he just kind of pulled everybody together and now we find places to go. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Zach. I, I'm actually Jeremy's brother. And so I kind of started right with him and we've been together a long time. Nice. Zach's our resident shy guy, so we got to pick on him as much as possible. No, oh, yeah. noted. Good. <laughs> I, I too, so my, yeah, you my sound sick today. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess Jonathan, that brings us to you. All right. My name is Jonathan. I'm with West Virginia Paranormal <clears throat> Investigations. Uh, we are based out of Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, I've been investigating the paranormal since 2007, uh, so almost 16 years now. Uh, been fortunate to travel all over the country visit a lot of places uh been on tv a few times and then i have uh my own paranormal web series on youtube as well thanks nice. nice well i guess how how do we want to do this i just i know i have a few questions so should we just fire them and whoever have wants to answer <laughs> lay into them deborah yep. lay into, okay um i'm curious about uh what kind of like do you use like equipment to use spirit boxes do you anybody want to take that Did I... we lost we part of your question i think okay we, uh, uh we we use like all sorts of equipment anything that we can use to help us um when, when we're investigating anything from like we have these little cat balls that we use that uh, can light up if you if they're touched um, to uh, having our DVR system that that we use as static cameras that we put around to, to also help us catch stuff when we're not there. So just numerous different things, uh, K2 meters, um, mel meters that we use. EVPs. You know, <laughs> And is there like an industry standard to like, because like, I know you can get apps on your phone and I've messed around with it a little bit, just, you know, 
curious. <laughs> um, but it's like, you know, is there stuff that it's like now nah, that's just garbage? <laughs> oh, um, I, I, so that's a tough question. So there's certainly opinions on equipment. And I think some individuals or groups will tell you apps may not contain some of the, the, the biometric sensors and other things that go into capturing evidence via some sort of electronic or, or analog met method. Um, so there's probably more controversy in that one. But again, this whole field is controversial. So I don't know that there's actually a set scientific standard right. that helps validate that. Um, I think what you do is you take a framework of these tools that we're using today and you and you hope that you know through a process elimination the tools that you bring to the investigation help you kind of determine um, whether or not you capture something that's abnormal or, or paranormal in this sense but yeah that, that's interesting and, and long strange question right <laughs> and a longer <laughs> answer i guess so what well, is the steel like the the best of the best you got the snap on of paranormal investigation tools mm -hmm. what would that be it's it's yeah. hard to pick one because each one does something differently right um so each piece of equipment you can use in a different way that can help you um sometimes maybe your millimeter is not picking anything up but your k2 is or you know vice versa just different things that you can use maybe the rem pod is like they don't like the REM pod, so they're gonna go to maybe the cat balls or you know a different type of beast and equipment. So it's just hard to pinpoint exactly which one is the best. Um, I guess it goes on personal opinion. And do you find, cause I'm pretty sensitive myself and I, I notice even talking with other sensitive people to this type of stuff, something that works for one person, um, you know, like energy work is different. Somebody else is, you know, more clairvoyant. So does, does your energy affect this, the, the tools you're using too, or does that not even play into it? I'd like to say as far as Jeremy goes, it seems like a lot of stuff wants to communicate with him because he is, a, he is sensitive. Right. And so like sometimes if we're not getting hits on the SB 11, throwing Jeremy on asking questions, sometimes we got a lot more answers. So, right, I mean, it makes sense. but yeah, sometimes I feel the energy does definitely affect what we're using and who's asking or who's listening, you know? What's your go-to, Jonathan, West Virginia style? Uh, we, we use a little bit of everything. We're fortunate to, to have recruited a lot of equipment over the years. Um, we do have some of the stuff that's, uh, people value like the Panasonic RRDR60 voice recorder. Uh, I do right have one of those. We built a lot of our own equipment. We have our own portals that we built. We built our own music boxes. We built our own rim pods. Um, so a lot of that kind of stuff that, that we personally have put time and effort into, I value over a lot of other pieces of equipment. So what goes into like building one of these pieces of equipment? Like, is it Raspberry Pi grade or is it just like, like how would you go about building one of these? Yeah, a lot of it uh, does use uh, a lot of like the circuit boards and the Raspberry Pis and the uh, different styles. There a lot of it is just repurposing things that have been made for other things like the rim pods. Uh, a lot of people will use like it's called a junior theremin, which is actually a musical device. Okay. But if you get close to the EMF source, it, it will trigger it. So repurposing something like that and then like the music boxes, uh, repurposing a, an IR sensor and then hooking it to a device that plays music when it's triggered. So just knowing what is involved and how they work, you can kind of build your own uh, spec to your own specs. Okay, so some of it's like actual got a computer chip motherboard in it and like the theremin that's more of a, how does how does a theremin style thing work? Because I know normally you put your hand and it does. It just right, so it, it puts or? off its own its own frequency. So basically, as somebody gets closer to the, the frequency, it's going to make a noise. So the idea is you put the rim pod or put it inside of a rim pod and have the antenna. If anything gets close to that antenna and breaks that wave, it will trigger it to, to light up. 
I would imagine that would be pretty fail safe, right? Like, because you literally have to have. Right. It, it's not going to just like randomly go off on its own. Like you can leave it sit there for hours or days at a time and it's not just going to randomly go off. It has to be physically triggered to go off. Okay. Oh. I was just going okay, well, to point out to Jonathan, he mentioned that the uh, DR60, that Panasonic is kind of the holy grail for a lot of EVB captures. We utilized it um, back in the summer at uh, McIntyre Villa. And I think some of the EP EVPs we ripped off of that were probably the most impressive set. So if you haven't seen a DR60, a Panasonic, that is definitely one of the, the, the holy grail. They're quite expensive. You're looking at $3,000 north for a recorder that's back from the 90s. But um, Is that, that the is, one they discontinued because it could see through people's clothing or whatever? <laughs> I don't know about thing? the clothing. But they did discontinue it very rapidly. If you look at the history and the lore of it, um, the Panasonic engineers uh, recalled it fairly quickly and replaced it with another version that didn't have the same results. So it's, okay. it's, it's a lore looking, on itself. You're looking through IR in that camera? No, it's a recorder. No, this, it's like a voice dicta, recorder. Yeah. It's oh, like a voice phone. recorder. Okay. Yeah. Doctors and lawyers and um, court reporters would use it um, to do dictations. Okay. And the reports started flooding into Panasonic. They were capturing voices that weren't there. EVPs. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it quickly put a gibosh on that. So if we could go back in time, stock up on those bad boys. Uh, we just, you, you we do, just got to go on Marketplace and find money, one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Minimum three grand right now, just for one. And these were $20 when they were new. Well, oh, sick. How yeah, hard do you we think got it would super, be? super fortunate. I did not pay anywhere close to that. I actually found one on eBay that somebody listed and they had no clue what they had. And I got wow. it for like $200. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I could sell it right now for $2,500 without breaking a sweat, but I, I don't think I'll ever give it up because I'll never find another one. Yeah. Oh, dude, you could, you could find all those parts. You just got to tear it apart. <laughs> Start mass producing here. <laughs> Okay, well, truth time across the board is every are all of you believers or are any of you the kind of you know there's um, there's always one person on the team that's a little more skeptical than the rest or Jeremy have you all, have you all seen enough that that's it. <laughs> I definitely think I've seen enough. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jimmy, did Jimmy just say Jeremy is the, the guy who's sensitive is the one who's a skeptic? No, no I was said amazing. Jeremy. <clears throat> Oh. You're the skeptic on the show. Dude, you're the skeptic. I'm not a skeptic. <laughs> I, I believe in fucking everything almost, except Troop Carbro. It's, like, it's just a dog of Maine. So the cool thing, like, uh, for instance, my brother, uh, he's a uh, skeptic. And he came over to my house a few years ago, and I had the spirit box. And we were playing it. And uh, my wife was sitting across from me, and I said, who's sitting on um, the ottoman across from me? And what you hear, what I still have the video, you hear plain as day, it says Brianna, which is my wife's name. My brother looks at me and goes, holy crap. And then we stopped and she got up to go outside to smoke. So I turned it on again and I asked, I said, what is uh, Brianna doing outside? And literally came across it, smoking. And my brother just sat there. He's like, how can this box answer the question that I just asked and know exactly what's going on? So. <laughs> He's still a skeptic, but that was like kind of changing his mind. Like, holy crap, like this might be true. I mean, you said it yourself. There's a Raspberry Pi in there. You're just typing away. Your brother's freaking out, coming through the speaker. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> um, I started as a, as a skeptic to a sense because I've always had experiences my whole life. Um, but I'm more analytical. So I need that quantifiable data. I need the, the facts to back it up. Uh, personal experiences, which I've had, and I know a lot of us have had are just hard to quantify, right? It's really difficult to bring that out as evidence. Um, so I sit more in the, I am not necessarily or more passive until we can verify or validate. That's where I probably stand. I think if, if you're a, an investigator and you're out in the field investigating, you have to maintain some sense of skeptability. Otherwise, it's completely pointless. If you go out and every single noise you hear is a ghost or every single 
EVP you get as a demon or like a lot of right. people will do, then it's pointless to be out there. You have to be able to try to debunk the situation. You have to try to figure out natural course or natural causes. And then if you can eliminate all of that and you're still left with something, then you have something that, that truly is paranormal. So I think if, if you're not skeptical in at least a little degree, then that can be a, a negative, negative impact on your investigations. Right, like your imagination that. would just be running wild and whatever, yeah. Well, let me ask you guys this. What do you think of those goddamn divining rods? You can find water. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it, too. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've never personally used them. Uh, I know I've seen them used, and I've seen them used in person. But again, I have no, to, no way to quantify that, right? Um, if you're using them, say, hey, there's a pot of gold here or a buried body there, or whatever you know, you're using it for, and it actually produces something, then I would say, you know, there's probably some credibility to it. But again, it, it kind of lies in that one of those tools that it doesn't really, um, unless it yields for sure results, it's, it's one of those difficult ones. I mean, I, cause I had paranormal investigators in my house like a year ago, over a year ago now. And like, well, uh, they were using those. And I'm, I'm standing there in the room like, no way this is a ghost pushing it to yes or no no fucking way now <laughs> more I mean, with you jeremy I, I, i'm definitely more scratching my head with those kinds of things for i mean sure. there's definitely a spirit in my house i know that it's i've had many psychics in my other paranormal podcast tell me like it's true they can sense it from where they are like and it's 100 percent true i've had i've done the whiskey water tests and everything else like but it's just it's in, like the divine rods just fucking throw me for a loop because i'm like I don't think a ghost is answering these questions, pushing shit back and forth. Like, come on. <laughs> like, it, if that's all I'm doing after I'm dead, then I wasted my afterlife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, touche. I, I, I've tried them, and they're just so easy to move. Like, it doesn't matter how, how, like, how hard I was trying to grab onto it, it would still move no matter what. Just a slight breeze and pushes it. So, for me, I'm more of a skeptic on that side because it's, it, can be so easily manipulated to do what you want it to do that it, it can't be a hundred percent like you can't say yes or no to what's happening at that time just because they can e so easily be moved mm -hmm. anything that has that type of physical interaction with a person even if you're not consciously moving it uh, i took a class of a physiology class in college and this was I wasn't even really into ghost hunting full time then, but it, it made a ton of sense after I learned this, uh, especially with somebody who uses like um, a crystal or something attached to a chain. There's a t bunch of tiny little muscles in your arm. And even if you don't move your arm, you can hold it as still as you want. But in your mind, if you're thinking left or right, if you're thinking forward or backward, there's tiny little muscles fire in your arm. And I watched myself. I had a string and a washer tied to it and I held it here and my hand didn't move at all, but I wanted it to go in a circle and I made it go in a circle. So anything that has a physical interaction with a person, whether it be uh, the divining rods or a Ouija board or um, anything like that, even if you're not consciously moving it, there's some subconscious thing that could play a part in that. So then you always have to take it with a grain of salt. And yeah. that's why I was asking about, you know, different people have different effects with the tools you use, because to me, a pendulum, what you're talking about, right. that's you connected, like that's your own energy channeling down connected, because every single person in the world is actually psychic, <coughs> and divining rods would be the same, so it's not, it's not a spirit moving anything, it is your own connection, and you're channeling through your own answers coming through, right? Right. So divining rods, that makes, that doesn't make any sense that you're using that to speak to spirits really it's not spirits like touching them it is yourself your own energy divining rods do work damn they work good. for water right yeah. yeah well i was a pipe layer for five years and like you guys could do this just get some copper you know like wire strip the plastic off and then put your toolbox in the middle of the room once you walk over that it's amazing how they cross like you have to hold them right where you're not actually like you know touching them at all they're just sort of resting but yeah you want to find a water pipe 12 feet in the ground you'll find it yep. it's pretty amazing to kind of, to kind of piggyback on like what jonathan said about your whole mind 
Um, it's kind of the reason why we use the Estes method for spirit boxes. Um, a lot of times you'll see people just put a spirit box down, turn it on, and you're, you're asking questions. Well, in your brain, if you ask the question of, hey, uh, you, you know, whatever, whatever question you ask, are you male or female, and you pick out male, like you want it to say male, you could, whatever comes across, your brain might interpret that as male, right? So you're oh, male. And you, so using the SS method with the spirit box, you kind of take that out of it because this person can't hear you, this, they can't see you. You ask the question, they respond from the box. And you don't just have everybody sitting around, you know, in their mind coming up with the answer. And then when the box comes across, they just, they believe they heard that answer. What is that method you're talking about? It's called the SS method. So, Someone takes a spirit box, they put on noise canceling headphones, and then they'll put on a, a blindfold. So they physically can't see you asking questions and they can't hear you asking questions. So okay. say, what's your name? Or a lot of times I like to say, can you say one of our names in the room? And if it does, it'll pull it up and say, Jeremy, well then how, how did that person hear me? They didn't hear me. So something communicating through that box to say, yep, I know who you are, you know, and give us our name. So it just helps solidify um, the responses. Maybe, yeah, what, what's coming across. So it's more evidential, right? It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah you can validate good. that, right? It's not as much circumstantial because if they're direct um, responses that I would say are more credible because the questions being asked by that who's asking those questions should have no interaction with the one reading the spirit box or at least listening to it. So it just provides more of um, an, an intelligent interaction is what we would probably say and it validates that. And how do you guys choose where you're going? Like your your places, do, do people just write into you with stories and if they sound, you know, like there's enough there or do you pick ones that are fairly well known or how do you decide where you're going and why? Some some we've done by lore, right? They have locations that are considered hotspots. Um, some are by people who've contacted us because of their home. Um, some are actual businesses that have provided, hey, we get this activity and you know, we've been able to go investigate them. So it's just kind of, uh, it's a myriad of different opportunities. Uh, some that you hunt for and some that, that people reach out to you. What about you, Jonathan? When I first started out, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, whatever it was, we did do a lot of in-home residential investigations. I feel like that's how most groups start out is uh, people reach out to them and need help. Um, and we've kind of moved away from that over the years just because there's a lot of liability that comes with residential investigations. Uh, and then when we launched the, the web series, especially a couple of years ago, uh, we've been focusing a lot more on uh, finding new locations that haven't ever been featured on online. And then also some of the larger locations and putting our own spin on it. So uh, we have traveled to a lot of the bigger locations, but we also like to try to find what we call hidden gems to where we can shine a light on places that have never been shown to others before. And when you say help to people, um, so you're just providing that, yes, there's entities here, or there's activity, and then do you direct them to mediums or do you guys bring a medium along to help remove energy or what do you, what do you mean by help? Yeah, We're like just, you guys just show up and be like, "Yep, you're fucked." Yeah, this place is <laughs> <Bye. laughs> like I wouldn't sleep here. <laughs> well, good night. So, so that's it's one of the water. things that I. Uh, one of the, the other reasons why we quit doing residential investigations is because we didn't have a way to to do anything about it. And people would want us to come in and not only verify that, yes, there was indeed having activity, but also do something about it. So we had no way to do that. And I think a lot of teams are in the situation that we're in, and they will actually go in and they'll make things worse for a lot of people because they don't know how to handle the situation. So I, I think residential should be more of a debunking exercise more than anything to where you go into a location and try to figure out a natural cause for what they're experiencing uh, versus going in with every piece of equipment in your bag and then freaking them out more than what they were before. So uh, there are things that have me. Right. <laughs> so, being extra, have so basically being an exterminator. 
That's what that's what some people want. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have a TV going on? Is no. am I the only one hearing it? I hear it, but I don't know I it's coming it, from. Yeah. I, I hear it too. Huh. Nothing. We don't have a TV going on here. No, my mine's paused. Let me turn my heater off. No, I thought it was me. I just, I muted my mic, but it wasn't. So. Yeah, I'm yeah, just hearing. I think it's background echo from our our chat. Yeah, I think this this is the most people we've had on, so it's probably just fucked up. So, mm. have you guys had anything that's so like, you know, crap your pants, scary? <laughs> Exorcist <laughs> style. You, yeah, like you. Yeah, like you needed therapy after for a bit. Or <laughs> have you ever seen girls up on the top of fucking roofs? Like, <laughs> oh, I wish. <laughs> you I wish. wish. Yeah, I don't know if I'd be like, what's your phone number or tell me where you're from? What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> no. that's, like, your type? that's a tough one. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, that's what we do, right? Um, yeah, I've never seen anything like that. We've had uh, a tremendously interesting, very active location in Kansas. Jeremy, if you want to touch on that. Whatever you want to touch on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Engel, uh, the other Jeremy. <laughs> Yeah. So many crickets, Jeremy. Keep it in your pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, the moonshine doesn't help with that, Scott. The moonshine doesn't help. Uh, you know, the McIntyre Villa down in Kansas is, man, that place, just so much stuff going on there. So much so much history and not not a lot of knowing about the history. Like, they, they know quite a bit, but there's still a lot that's unknown to what happened there. And just just the stuff that we got, um, you know, for instance, Jimmy was sitting on a spirit box and literally the spirit box said uh, inside the house and I heard running up the stairs. So we stopped what we're doing and we checked the whole house and the property because we thought someone came in and we get a text from the owner saying, hey, look, you guys locked the door and two minutes later, the door unlocked by itself. Like just things like that, like holy crap, like what, what is going on? Like you do get freaked out because I seriously thought someone was in the house and I actually thought it was a spirit letting us know, like, hey, someone's in the house and we need to go get them out. But there was no one there. Like and we checked the whole of the property. We had the owner go through the cameras. There was no one on the cam no, no one on the cameras. And then when she told us that the back door unlocked by itself, that that was pretty crazy. What about you, Jonathan? You got some? Uh... <laughs> uh, I'll stay on here and tell <laughs> stories for hours if you let me. I I got stories for days. Uh, one of the craziest things that happened to me was actually in Kansas as well, uh, in that same town at the Sally House. Uh, I visited the Sally House a few times, uh, and I actually got scratched while I was there. I had three long scratches down my entire forearm and I was the only one in the room. There was nobody else there. There was no other physical explanation. I didn't brush up against anything. I didn't uh, scratch my arm, anything like that. Uh, but all of a sudden I felt burning and I had three long scratches down my arm. So I've had, that's the only time I've ever been like physically harmed. Uh, I've been touched. I've been like pushed before. There have been times like you were talking about one of which was that, uh, Sweet Spring Sanitarium down in Southern West Virginia. We heard somebody run. I'm not talking about like footsteps in a, in a hallway. It was running. I heard somebody sprint across and we for sure thought somebody broke in. We literally stopped our filming, put our cameras down. Somebody had a concealed carry. They grabbed their concealed carry. We walked the entire building to make sure that somebody didn't break in because uh, we were so sure that somebody else was in the building. So yeah, a lot stuff like that I've I've experienced, but uh, yeah, stories stories for days for me. <laughs> so, what do you guys put in those concealed carries? Is that like some fucking rock salt shit? Uh, bubble gum. Those, those are for the the Only living people. Gum. Those aren't oh, for the okay. ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you, you guys have both been to Kansas. Do you know the pixelated paranormal? They do the investigative shit too. They got a podcast out in Kansas. I don't think so. Yeah, I've never oh, heard of okay. them. I heard of them. No. Uh, so on the concealing carry, though. Have you ever had anybody though, along that ran, like, left, like, couldn't take it, you know, anybody in your team quits because they were, it's just too scary, or are you guys all sturdy-hearted? Uh, same <laughs> location last time with a different event. 
um, that was in the last video we just put out a week ago, we did take a break when we had everything happen. Um, the three of us literally went outside for about 20 minutes and that's when we started playing back the DR60. And that's when we captured some of the most creepiest, terrifying EVPs I think we've ever captured. So that was that one moment that Jeremy's talking about that we literally, after scouring the home, collected ourselves and sat out there for about 20 minutes just to get our heads right, you know, because we don't, we also don't want to, we don't want to tamper with our beliefs going forward either. You know, we want to make sure we're kind of clear headed getting back in there. Right. Yeah, we, we've definitely had to take breaks before and, and catch your uh, thoughts and composure and take a deep breath. Uh, I've never had to leave a location, uh, but there, there have been times where you need to just take a step back and kind of get your head right before you go back into it for sure. And here's Scott's biggest worry if we do this, is what? It, have you ever had anything follow you home? <laughs> no, we are, every time we leave a location, we... We say you can't come with us. You got to stay here. <laughs> oh, and I'm sure that that's what different. <laughs> but they're already in the car waiting for you. <laughs> Every new house, I'm just like blowing a blunt of sage through the whole fucking <laughs> thing, hot box. And it. See, see, the bad thing about being sensitive is, it's like nonstop for me. So like stuff always it always happens with me. Like no matter where I go, I'm like whatever, if they follow me home, it, it doesn't matter because stuff's already happening. You know, might as well just keep adding more to it. <laughs> so. So what do you guys think happens when you die? Like, have you ever gotten to the point you both said you need to take a break, right? Have you ever just been like in the house when shit's happening and say, fuck with me, dude. When I get on the other side, I'm going to fuck you up. But you think happens with question, ghosts, right? That's why we're doing this. That is the ultimate question. It's the one thing we all share in unity. What is the other side? What happens? Um, so, oh, <laughs> that's a great one. So, go ahead, Jeremy. I believe. Okay, so being sensitive, I so I don't claim that I'm a medium. So, I for for me, I can feel spirits, and they can they can like tell me where they're at. I, I don't normally see them. You know, they just. I don't know. It's hard to explain how the way I'm sensitive. So I can use feelings and they can tell me like when they're sad, mad, um, they can tell me where they're at. We've been at locations and I'm like, Oh, they're not in here. They're actually down the hallway and we'll go to that other room. And, and sure enough, we'll start getting activity. Um, but on your question, I, I had a dream one night and I believe that this was a hundred percent I was being shown kind of what it's like to be on the other side. Um, but also at the same time, um, it brings up, you know, we always hear these EVPs of people screaming and, you know, like yelling or, and we think they're mad. We think that, oh, it's a bad spirit or it's a demon. <clears throat> Just a quick rundown. Basically in my dream, me and my wife both died. Um, when we came back, the world was, it was like it was nighttime. You could see lights on in houses. Um, we went up to people, we tried to talk to people, um, we couldn't, oh, I could talk to her, she could talk to me, we couldn't talk to people, I was getting upset, I would start screaming at me like, hey, can you hear me, you know, are you, uh, you know, am I dead, what's going on, and, and that just went on, I just, I, I really feel that that's kind of what it was like, like, you can see everything, it's like you're living, but you're not, people can't hear you, and then you start yelling and maybe using that energy to that, you know, in a, in a way that they can hear you. That sounds horrible, dude. A, <laughs> no, really we just walk around in the darkness forever. No, no, one, ever, no, one, ever, no one ever said it was pleasant, man. <laughs> At least you had your wife. Like, I right. just destroy me, man. I don't but that, could, that, that could be a hell of a Just having, gonna say. <laughs> having, your, having, having your wife could be hell. <laughs> right yeah. you know, I, I want my wife there with me. Like and the, my the kids crazy that's thing about bad, it but... you know the crazy when i think about it you know how like if we lose a loved one we're sitting here like i wish i could talk to you one more time um so in that dream too we actually saw our two daughters and they were both praying and i remember this vividly they were by their bed saying i wish i could just talk to my mom one time i wish i could talk to my dad and actually I would, I was feeling the emotion. I didn't cry, but I was feeling the emotion 
of sadness, like, hey, I am here. I, I am trying to talk to you. You know, I'm, I'm right here. But they couldn't see me. They couldn't hear me. And so when I woke up, I was actually crying because I was like, holy crap, that that dream was was crazy. So it was kind of like I came like we were there and we were trying to talk to our loved ones, but they couldn't hear us. Yeah, see, I'm thinking more like 300 years down the road where you don't know fucking anyone, dude. And like you're just walking around in the darkness. That and I, I think you would move, like, you, I don't think every every single person stays around being a ghost forever. I think there's there's reasons spirits come around. And I'm I'm sensitive, too, and it's exactly like you were um, saying. It's, it's different. I don't see, like, I can't, I don't see an apparition, but I feel things and I smell things and I can describe what the spirit is very yep. very accurately actually <laughs> um but you know I don't think every single you know person is a you know when once they pass that they're all just ghosts like milling around hanging around us <laughs> I think if they're if you're needing them or they need to finish something with you then they they can communicate if you're open to it and I think every person can be open to it or what if, I mean, actually. what if they're more like trans-dimensional though meaning they're exactly. able to face through different um dimensions they can transfer back and forth that's what i think happens periods. yeah right. you're really really sad you need your grandma they can you know she can show up but she's not necessarily hanging around you in your house all the time well, constantly. i no mean deborah what, what do you think of the stories when uh a father will be driving with one of his kids past the cemetery mm -hmm. and all of a sudden his kid asks him why are all those people there? And he looks over and there's he can see no one. Well, so there are there are a lot of spirits and kids. I mean, um, kids are way more sensitive than adults. Animals are too, right? Yep. So um, I I believe the we just grow are. out of that. Like we block that as we grow up because we're taught to because of religion and because of society. And you're busy. You're just too busy with or because we're working. lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad it's well <laughs> it's not actually a scary or bad thing that's what i think but um because you actually you know he's right when he says you're not coming home or you have control right you, you know that's at least my experience you have control. nothing can attach to you if you're you know if you're not getting scared and allowing us you know what i mean well, no, you're still getting scared, right? You're just saying, no, you can't come home with me. <laughs> like next time somebody like has a gun to you in the parking lot, just say, no, you can't come home with me. And try to get in your car. <laughs> you would start, like my people. That's works, different. Dude. But when it comes to energy, this is my experience. When it comes to energy, um, you can, you know, you can for, you know, you say no, they cannot attach to you without your permission, without somehow allowing them in. So Nancy Reagan was right. Just say no. Say no. Just say no. <laughs> <laughs> it works in so many situations. <laughs> it's it's oh. kind of like the black eyed children. Like right. they can't they can't come into your home unless you allow them to. Yeah. So I mean, I know Town Massachusetts where they can go to every door that people let them in. Was it was that our first episode? Yes, was it was our, our first episode. Yeah. Our was first it the episode. first? No, our first no, 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 no. it was yeah. the second it's, or third. Yeah. Um you're so Canadian, Deborah. It's when to go. Oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's a monster. <laughs> He's scary. Our fourth, our fourth host was there with us at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so do you guys, uh, Jeremy, go. So, do you guys investigate anything besides just spirits? Like, you ever gone uh, squatching? <laughs> never, never squatching. But we often remind ourselves this isn't just about um we'll say ghosts right because again go back and go back to whether they're interdimensional or transdimensional i mean are we dealing with things that we don't even understand um in, in our current development in our brain where we're at as a society and as a species are we dealing with things that are just totally outside the realm when you look at some of the theories of like skinwalker ranch and how that can be uh, dimensional uh, portals and th different entities or beings or even extraterrestrials if you want that are able to kind of phase in and out of our reality and our dimension um, not everything may be just checked off as a ghost and again until someone's a, a, a doctor in this field and has all the answers we have to kind of be open-minded to all these different things um, not not that I'm against Sasquatching but um, certainly everything that kind of fits in that bill why not 
Yeah, I, I, being in West Virginia, that's a big thing for us. Uh, I've never been out personally, but I have some really good friends who, who run organizations uh, dedicated to Bigfoot or Sasquatch, also to uh, a lot of UFO or extraterrestrials. We have a lot of famous cases here with uh, Mothman, with Flatwoods Monster, I mean, a oh. bunch of different places like that in West Virginia. So I, I've done a ton of research in that. Uh, that arena and I think like you're talking about there's there's a whole line of thinking that Bigfoot is not even a physical creature it's an interdimensional being who uh, can uh, come I and go as that. it pleases that's why nobody's ever found a body or anything like that so there's because a whole they bury their about day. that I don't know if I believe that but it's interesting to think no. about I will agree to almost any cryptid except for Bigfoot being ultra dimensional <laughs> This guy believes, believes in dinosaurs, air. okay? He believes dinosaurs are still here. Hey. We're not gonna break them. Hey, Macaulay and Bembe exists. Thank you. But <laughs> I'll give you that. But so and the and the raptors in Chile. But I mean big and the freaking uh no Arizona shit, dude. No Arizona. The, the, thunder, shit. the thunder the Thunderbird pterodactyls in Arizona exist, but <laughs> caves, cop, caves. But no, I mean I can't accept big I had Lon Strickler on my show. He's a big Pennsylvania paranormal investigator. I'm sure you've heard of him, Phantoms and Monsters Radio. Yeah. He he insists that Bigfoot is ultra terrestrial. I'm like, no, impossible. <laughs> it's gigantic for fuck's sake. It's been around since the beginning of time. So, I mean, <sighs> any other creature, I could, um, I mean, even Dogman to a degree, I could say maybe ultra terrestrial, but. No. What if, what if you're both right and now he just learned to time travel? <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure he did. And I'm pretty sure he's gonna go uh slap uh George Washington around a little bit, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> hey Jonathan, Bigfoot should so... Bigfoot should be in charge. <laughs> Jonathan, I was gonna ask because you brought up Mothman. How far are you from Point Pleasant? Because that's one of the most popular mothman you know history or lore if you will well, i mean it happened the, the events in, in west virginia in point pleasant happened but how far are you from that uh only about two and a half hours away so not not too far away. Mm. west virginia you can basically go from one side of the state to the other in about three hours max so you're never too yeah. far I'm, I'm like an hour away from uh, trans allegheny lunatic asylum i'm like an hour away from west virginia penitentiary in moundsville mm -hmm. i'm like two and a half hours away from sweet spring sanitarium uh, yeah, so I'm centrally located to just about everything, which is really nice. And, and, yeah. and Delaware, no taxes. <laughs> yeah, Delaware. yeah. <laughs> buy them cigarettes, buddy. It's, it's, called, it's called New Hampshire, Scott, but I mean. No, basically... when I was in Pennsylvania, we would drive to Delaware to get all of our shit tax-free. Yeah, New Hampshire, New Hampshire is the same thing, but. Uh, we're closer I mean, to Delaware. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it, it, I was going to say, it's funny that West Virginia, for being one of the smallest freaking states out there, has like the most paranormal activity in its small borders. And Absolutely. I mean, it's all because the, the government's right there. That's all why. <laughs> Have you ever investigated the where that bridge was? Like where the Mothman Bridge was? Uh, there's, there's not really a way to get to that. Um, okay. I've been to the like the uh, TNT domes and things like that in Point Pleasant. A lot of people think that that's where Mothman either was or is. Uh, so a lot of people investigate that area, but there's not really a way to investigate like the Silver Bridge area anymore. Well, I mean, you, come on, let's not cut any corners. You could <laughs> get, get a backpack and hike down there. Well, I mean, if I got, I guess if I got a boat and went out in the middle of the river, I could do it. But that'd be about now we're thinking. <laughs> Report back. I mean, scuba yeah. gear and but put it this way, I. The Mothman is not only in West Virginia. He, I mean, I interviewed someone who saw him in Bear, Massachusetts in the late 90s. Yeah. There's actually uh, been worldwide, actually really. Been, uh, quite I a mean, few Chernob in, in Minnesota. Too. Well. So I was actually talking to a guy at a Paracon and he studies a lot of this. I forget his name, but he's got books. He was on TV. Um, and he said he's been hearing a lot of reports that it's coming west more. Like it's starting to be seen a lot more west. So, and like we've had sightings in Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, Chicago. Illinois. So, I mean, they, Trump, Trump, Trump even talked about it in Chicago. They, yeah, they didn't they Scott. see him by the the airport? Like there were actual airport employees that said they saw him, or was that a different cryptid? It's the Denver airport. He was going down there to meet the other cryptids. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I remember well, that would make the sense. Airport though. people said they saw him. 
Is that legitimate, Scott? That was an actual report through... That was some... something I heard on multiple podcasts that were probably 100% full of shit. So, <laughs> so, so very accurate. <laughs> That's great. Whatever I remember is just regurgitated through nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> so do you guys, do any of you... Uh collect things like are you like what's that zach by his name with the museum full of haunted stuff <laughs> that you that take from his home? Baggins. <laughs> yeah like some annabelle shit yeah yeah do you have, we, you have we all, holes uh, in the closet? <laughs> never we don't ever take anything we don't take anything from the actual locations but one thing that we do on almost every investigation is we'll try to find an antique store nearby whatever location we're going to and we'll try to find a lot of stuff associated either with the town or with the building itself. So I have like, uh, at one point we investigated a church in West Virginia and I have a, a Bible that we found in uh, the antique store from like 1903. Uh, I have uh, an old, I forget, I have all kinds of stuff, but I have old books. I have like creepy dolls, like you're talking about creepy stuff, the animals. I, I have all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Oh, I Creepy love animals. that stuff. <laughs> Your Creepy fucking animals. ghost thing's pretty cool, dude. I like that. <laughs> Thanks. We I need to get that. some shit like that. Come on now. You want to pay for us? Copy my guess. <laughs> yeah. I told you I'd send you jerky. Jesus Christ. Oh, oh you can send me. Oh, please. I'll, I'll give my address for jerky. Fuck, for lamb jerky? Okay, dude, give I'll, it to I'll... me right now and I'll write it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get an Annabelle to me. mail. Yeah, I'll send you some I mean, jerky. For for lamb jerky, I'd sell part of my soul, but I'm just saying. But what about jerky? What about you guys? You guys got any haunted artifacts? I stay away from that. Ten foot pole. Nope. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right. we, so we know uh, Brian Murray. He was on Ghost Hunters. So they did um, sleep. I, I, sleepless unrest and they went to the conjuring house and each person took something home and i asked him like the stuff happening he goes oh yeah i have a camera sitting on it all the time you know and each person took something and each thing and now they have stuff happening in their house because they took it so like for me like jimmy said nope i nope i won't take anything i leave it I, nope not bringing that home because it's so an invitation basically yeah to Start it up. <laughs> this is a question I've got for you. Like, you guys go do your paranormal investigation on like specific places. Have you ever narrowed it down to like an object, like in the Conjuring movies? Well, most recently, and it was a video we just released. Um, there was a doll from the late 1800s. It's a puppet, actually, and it's got human hair sewn into it. And um All right, that's creepy as fuck. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's a whole nother level of creepy, even just by itself in physical presence, it's just so creepy. Um, but while we were doing a spirit box session, um Jeremy had detected in our FLIR camera that there was a hot spot coming off of it. And he finally got my attention. I take my headphones off and you know, I'm trying to debunk it. I'm like, oh, that, that's just a reflection of a mirror or it's the glass one case that it's in. And after about five minutes of me trying really hard to find a reason for it, I just couldn't anymore. And that doll was really hot. It was uh, at least 10, 15 degrees uh, higher in temperature, which is quite a bit for a flare to, to, to get that difference in the temperature variation. But it was during that moment that the doll and our DR60 started responding to us. Um, we got the message. We were trying to, I'm trying to say it's a reflection. And at the time sync of the DR60, you hear the doll say, no, it's not. Meaning, no, it's not a reflection. And then rapidly right after that, um, it says, no, it's hot. And that's me again, trying to debunk the whole thing. So it's like the doll's getting pissed off at me. That's the closest interaction that I got myself, Jeremy and Josh, with that kind of uh, question that you asked. And then you did you tell them to get the fuck rid of that thing? <laughs> oh, they love it. Now they love it even more. I mean, we provided them with more ammunition for that place than anything because of what we captured. So no, that thing's like on a pedestal now. It's still <laughs> locked, of course, but... And, and the that's... crazy thing, Jimmy was like, hey, can we open it? And I was like, no. And at that instance, again, we got an EVP saying, don't get me. 
Like he was telling us, like, oh. don't touch me. Like, don't just leave me right. sit here. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. But the, the crazy thing is with FLIR, it's not supposed to go through glass because it's supposed to bounce off, right? Because glass is just a reflective thing. So how are we seeing this thing that was hot when the FLIR shouldn't be going through glass? Like it, when I, I even looked it up, I said, can it go through glass? And it says, nope. Basically what happens is the, the FLIR comes out, hits the glass and it'll actually reflect backwards towards the FLIR. And so then you might get, you might pick up a person on it because it's hitting the glass and coming back. But like Jimmy said, we sat there and everybody would move and the object on it wouldn't move on the screen. Like it was staying right there. So we were like, oh, that's, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> Yeah, we, we like to use a lot of trigger objects in our investigations, either stuff that's at the location or, like I said, stuff that we find at an antique store and we take with us. Uh, one of the coolest ones that we ever did was at a uh, prison in Ohio, uh, and we'll use a technique to where if you take a metal object and you wrap it with copper wire, you can connect it to a rim pod. Uh, and if you touch the, the metal object, the rim pod will go off, so you don't even have to touch the rim pod. So we had a one of the Folger Adams prison keys. We had it wrapped in wire, and then we had it connected to three rim pods. So we had a daisy chain down an entire hallway. The only time that that key was alone, when all uh, four of us were upstairs, the only time that this key was by itself and nobody else was on that level, something touched the key and made all three rim pods go off at the same time. So having something like that, it definitely seemed like whoever was there was trying to get the key to get out of there. Uh, which was a really cool experience. So that's that's more like like a spirit trying to touch the fucking object. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I got it. I have no idea what a rim pod is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of, I got to do my homework, dude. We're on a paranormal podcast. <laughs> check out our, our check out the web series. Yeah. We we use it all. You'll 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 see it all. It's well, I really want one of them ghosts, dude. That ghost is dope. <laughs> I'm getting one. Yeah. <laughs> who's Who's next up for the questions? Jeremy, Deborah. Uh, I mean, have you ever done anything with a demon? That's <laughs> like noticed one. Well, I, I, I don't got... think I don't think uh, most things that people say are demons are really demons. I think oh, they're that not. Term but... is wildly overused to to clickbait people mm -hmm. uh, and to get views. I think demons are so incredibly rare that most people will never actually experience an interaction with a demon. Uh, I've only ever been in one place that I thought could potentially be, and I still don't think it was. And that was at the Sally House, and that's only because I got scratched. Uh, and I still don't think it was a demon. I think it was just something there that was either angry or trying to get my attention. I don't know. Uh, so I think maybe 0.01% of people that say they have demon interactions is actually realistically demonic haunting. Well, it's all we right. Yeah, we fully agree I mean, with that too. We don't, we don't agree that demonic possession or demonic entities are very common. It's more rare to the percentage Jonathan's talking about. You're probably going to find more angry spirits, things that are just pissed off because they had a bad day. They stepped on a Lego. I don't know. <laughs> but you know d demonic is extremely rare um i do find it interesting that you had a three finger scratch though jonathan which right. is indicative of you know the 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 trinity um right that's, that's one of the like that. one of the reasons why i thought that potentially it could be but there was never enough backing to that to where i would go oh yeah that was definitely demonic in nature uh, a yeah. lot of times people theorize that that angry or negative spirits will do that uh, just as a way to kind of make people not come back and leave them alone so to scare you yeah it, it, yeah it could have easily been that more than an actual demonic interaction yeah uh, I, I mean i agree i mean i think it's rarely demons but i also believe the theory that demons are really aliens and that's uh, why could be and they, i mean they, they, they can control your mind because they are an advanced species that could be the transdimensional or interdimensional, you know, outlook or beings that were that we were mentioning earlier. It most certainly could be. We just don't know. Mm. If I was a demon, yeah. I would try to honeypot you guys in. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'd be super sweet and answering all your questions. Here's a butterfinger. <laughs> well, hey, hey, I mean, Scott, mine. Scott, you're a little older than me, I think. So, um, when you when you go when you go down there and you become a demon, uh, like tell the big guy I'm waiting for my deal to sell my soul because I got a couple things I need. I'm I'm going to be a libertarian demon, my friend. I'll be out by myself. So, like on demons, for my belief they're out there like they're out there but they're from what i've learned through my belief um is that they're more like temptation right so they want you to sin they're trying to get you to do things that you know would, would make you sin not necessarily they're going to come up and just scratch you push you and just try to possess you i think those are more rare 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 cases that like those things are happening but like they're there and basically they're just there to, to tempt you, to make you do things that are going to make you sin. And, you know, obviously that way it's a kind of a win for them. Um, you know, I've never, the only time that I thought I was playing with a demon was at my house to see black shadow people all the time. And I don't know if it was, if it was actually them, I went and saw a priest. He gave me holy water. Once I used the holy water in my house, they disappeared except for uh outside my house um one day my kids ran inside screaming saying i saw this large giant black man across the street not not like black in the race it was just pure black and they said it was looking at them from across the street um now i believe them because they went crying and screaming saying this this thing is looking at them across the street do i believe it's demon I don't know. I don't know what it is, but th that's just my belief on the whole demon thing. Like, I just, I don't think they're out to possess everybody. I just think it's more of a temptation to get you to sin type of deal. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, they're, all, they're, they're Crowley. They're all Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> Traded his soul for two extra inches. There we go. Well, so talking about possession and stuff, have you guys ever run across someone who um, was displaying any sort of um, signs of that like where they have an entity in them or anything like that besides jeremy up there <laughs> <laughs> we, we did have a case we did have a case like where there was a family and the mom i think was attracting this energy yeah. i wouldn't necessarily say attached um but i think there was a strong energy attachment um, and things were certainly surrounding the mother in this case and it was impacting as some of the family members but very heavily geared towards the mother. So I won't go as far as a possession, but I think attachments and um, focused attachment is highly likely for what we experienced in that one case. I've, I've never seen it personally. The only thing that I've heard of that uh, I believe and I trust was uh, happened at a church and it was my cousin was there and we're about the same age. So we basically grew up like brothers and I trust him. So I, I, there's no reason he would ever lie to me. Uh, he was working and they were praying over a guy and they said they saw his face like morph, like it changed, like it didn't like change to something else, but it like twisted almost. Uh, like reptilian? It, it freaked him out so bad. Um, but that's the only thing that I've ever heard that I actually believe that, that it could be something like that. But again, I, I have no way to know that that's a possession uh, it could have been just about anything, but that that one always stuck with me. That story. That's what about, bro. What about that's what, we're, yeah, uh, I think so. <laughs> like we're we're coming up on an hour here. I do want to hear from the two dudes that have been quiet the whole time <laughs> for the last five minutes of the show. What is the scariest thing you've ever been involved in? I would say for me, we went to investigate a hotel in Pipestone, Minnesota. It's not, it's, it's more just because it happened to me, a personal experience. But I uh, went to bed and then I got too warm. So I pulled the blankets down. And by the time my head hit the pillow, the blankets were back up to my chin. And I don't have a reason or a response for it. Otherwise, as far as activity, that investigation didn't really yield a lot of, you know, info on what was there. But that one interaction kind of just scared the crap out of me. One, I was pretty tired still. And two, I've never had a personal experience that, like that. No, I mean, that's like my personal experiences. That's kind of close. It, 
involved three dogs, but similar. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, you, buddy? I guess I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I'm just a camera guy, so I'm just sitting behind the camera the whole time. And I don't oh, know. you got to find all the shit, dude. You're the camera dude. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I guess I, I haven't had too many that kind of like freaked me out or anything. I mean, we got an EVP one time that it either said help call or help me Jesus or call me Jesus. That was kind of freaky because I was, because I, uh, I was there doing that EVP with him actually. So, I mean, that was, that was kind of crazy, but. Well, yeah, no, man. Thank you guys for coming. Why don't you give a shout out to your teams? Uh, we'll start with Jonathan. <clears throat> yeah, I appreciate you having me on. This was a lot of fun. Uh, like I said, West Virginia Paranormal Investigations on Facebook. Uh, we do a lot of interaction there. We do occasionally live stream our investigations. Uh, and then check us out on YouTube, www.youtube.com slash WVPara. We have our Forgotten Relics web series. Uh, we're into season two, and we're about to begin filming for season three. So we got a lot of cool stuff coming up soon. And you're going to show me where the hell you bought that ghost thing. <laughs> I, I made it, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, you should sell them on Etsy. Just so I should. <laughs> That's that's a great Etsy sell. I'm going to agree with that one. <laughs> um, yeah, for American Paranormal Investigative Team, uh, we thank you guys for having us come on. We always enjoy this. Uh, it's fun to kind of have a chit chat and get everyone's views and different takes on it. So we really appreciate it, especially meeting another team like Jonathan. It's really cool to kind of hear some of the similar stories, similar beliefs and in investigative strategies. So we're always appreciative of that, too. Um, we're again, very similar to Jonathan and his team. We just wrapped up uh, season two. We've got two more videos for that that are about completed and will be released. And we've already got our 2023 first half scheduled uh, to go th through some really cool places like Villisca, I'm sure. I know Jonathan, you've been there yet, but we're heading up to Villisca next um, and a couple of other pretty interesting locations in that, that general area of Kansas and Iowa. So. Um, look forward to that. You can always get us at uh, Facebook, American Paranormal Investigative Team. Our handle on YouTube is American or at sign American Paranormal and American Paranormal Team at uh, TikTok as well. So yeah, come by, check us out. You know, definitely check out Jonathan. We seem to have a lot of similarities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And uh, looking forward to checking you guys out and seeing a lot of your work. Uh, and then if you guys ever make it out to West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, anything like that, let, me, let us know. We'll, uh, we'll team up and have some fun. For sure. Yeah, and we want to. We've talked about that, actually. Uh, Trans-Allegheny and a couple of other places in that, uh, that five-state region we've talked about recently. Lots of good places out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thanks for having us on here, Scott and team, Deborah and yes. Jeremy. We appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you guys for coming on, man. I'm sorry we couldn't go longer. Yeah, dang, uh, I got I another podcast <laughs> going after this, but it was really cool. If you guys want to come back on, hit us up. For sure. All right. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Have a great night. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Live stream is done. Jonathan Johnson is gone. <laughs> Where is, uh, oh, there's Jeremy. Hey, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Goodbye. All right, go to the next one, Scott. How do I get oh, no. How do I leave? You press the leave Here, button. I'm, I'm going to end it for everybody. All right, he left. Okay. The other guy tried to join at four. I don't understand because he – I let him pick the times. I was hoping he was going to pick prior to our show, but he picked uh, seven Western – or, yeah, seven Western, ten Eastern – and then he texted me at 4.20 and was like, hey, I'm on the fucking show. What? No. Yeah. And 10 Eastern like, is oh. 8. You got, you're right. So, yeah. No, I was yeah. totally right. I had my wife 
check it out and everything. I hate all the time zones. My God. That was pretty good other than the background noise. I think it was coming from the dude on my bottom screen. Jeremy. Yeah, I think it was coming from there, Jeremy. But uh, Yeah. I mean, uh, wait a minute. So was, our se- so was our second show canceled or what? No, he didn't cancel. He's joining in, what do we got? Four minutes. Um, All right. Well, I'm going to go smoke a cigarette and I'll open it now so I can hear everything. But I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a piss. Deborah, you are in charge. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> if you got to pee first, I'll let you go pee first. But <laughs> he's got a whole team coming on too. I wish we could have kept that going. But where'd Jeremy go? We're joining the next next stream i'll see you on the other side oh so do we get we get off of here and then get back on is there another link uh yeah i'm pretty sure i sent the other link let me let me check and make sure i sent it i didn't Global see i didn't see a second one yeah I yeah the up. next the next link is in there is it just the go chat? to our messenger okay. and i will meet